front desk, chapter 9. I walked home by myself after school, looking over my shoulder as I made the crossing from Meadow Lane onto Coast Boulevard. It was like crossing over into a different world. Back at the motel, I dashed to find my parents to tell them the news that Jason Yao was in my class, but as it turned out, they had other problems to worry about. The washing machine in the laundry room was busted. There was water everywhere, and my dad had foam up to his knees. Quick, he said, pointing to a bucket. Hand me that. I gave him the bucket. It filled, it filled in a matter of seconds, and I dragged it out of the laundry room to the parking lot, watching as the murky water spilled onto the ground like a tidal wave. As soon as it was emptied, I took it back into the laundry room, fill and spill, fill and spill. When the last of the water was emptied and the laundry room all wiped down, my parents got on the phone with Mr. Yao. I picked up the receiver in my room so I could listen. What now? Mr. Yao barked. I'm terribly sorry, but we're going to need a new washing machine. My dad said, what did you do? Did you break it? Mr. Yao asked annoyed, you idiot. He's not an idiot. I yelled into the phone. Mia, get off the phone, my dad said. I said okay and put the phone down on the table for a second, then very quietly picked it back up. You're paying for it, and guess what? They're not cheap, Mr. Yao said. Mr. Yao, please be reasonable, my dad pleaded. I didn't break it. I just got here. I barely even touched it. Well, you must have done something because now it's broken, and if you want a new washing machine, you're going to have to pay for it. Mr. Yao said before slamming down the phone. My mother was so furious after the call, she was shaking. That man, she shrieked. But no matter how mad she got, there was no avoiding the fact that we had to get a new washer. Mr. Yao had told my dad right before we got off the phone that it would take several days before it could be delivered. My dad paced back and forth in the living room, trying to figure out how we were supposed to live without a washing machine for so long. Every day, the tower of dirty towels from the customers was as tall as me. Maybe we could send it out, my dad said, thinking out loud, then quickly shook his head when he thought about how much that would cost. And who would be paying for it? Certainly not Mr. Tightwad. What if we told people not to use so many towels, I suggested. Again, my dad shook his head. We're a motel. We have to have towels, he said. With a sigh, he turned to my mom and said, we're just going to have to wash them all by hand. My mom groaned on top of all the other things they had to clean. It didn't take long before the laundry room was teeming with towels. There were piles and piles of them sitting in buckets on the floor, hanging on the door. Every time I walked by the laundry room, there seemed to be more of them, like the towels were meeting each other in the laundry room, getting married and having babies. I knew I had to do something, so I went around to all the weeklies and explained the situation. They were all very sympathetic. They vowed to limit their towel usage to one towel a day until the new washer arrived. Thanks so much for understanding, I said to Hank. He and Billy Bob were in Hank's room cooking hamburgers on Hank's hot plate. Not a problem, Hank said, throwing patties onto the pan. They didn't have enough ground beef, so Hank was taking a bunch of saltines and mushing them up. Then he added the ground up cracker crumbs to his ground beef. I watched as he shaped the crumbly ground beef mixture expertly into more patties. Wow! It looks just like a real hamburger, I said to Hank. Oh, sure, it tastes like one too, he said, handing me a cooked one. Gingerly, I lifted the saltine burger to my mouth and took a bite. He was right. It tasted just like the real thing, only crunchier. I devoured the burger. I'm sorry you guys have to pay for the new washer, Hank said as he threw more patties onto the sizzling pan. Typical Mr. Yao squeezing us for every last penny. He handed me another saltine burger. As I chewed, I thought about how nice it was that Hank lumped us together with the weeklies rather than Mr. Yao. 
Despite all our efforts, the mountain of towels continued to grow at an alarming rate. There just wasn't enough time to wash all of them by hand every night. That Sunday, I promised to help my dad knock out a bunch of them. We put them into buckets, filling the buckets with water and dumping in the laundry detergent. Then we sat down and scrubbed them by hand until our fingers turned into raisins. Even then, there were still dozens of dirty towels left. So many, in fact, that we soon ran out of buckets. We're going to have to go over to the Home Depot and buy more buckets, my dad said, shaking his head. Buckets were $4.99 each. That was more than a Big Mac cost, and we couldn't even afford those. But I had an idea. I grabbed as many of the rest of the dirty towels as I could and ran toward one of the empty guest rooms. Follow me, I said to my dad. I headed straight for the bathroom where I dumped the dirty towels into the bathtub, ran the water, and sprinkled the laundry detergent. But how are we going to scrub them, my dad asked. I grinned at him and started rolling up my pants. As soon as my dad saw that, he smiled and started rolling his up too. We jumped in the tub together, the water sloshing and splashing as the wet towels tickled our toes. We made so much noise, jumping and screaming and laughing, that my mom came to see what was going on. What are you guys doing? She asked. We froze when we saw her, bracing for a lecture. But when I peeked at her face, I didn't find a frown. Scoot over, she said. My mom started rolling up her pants. That afternoon, my parents and I hopped and hopped and hopped, laughing so hard we soon forgot we were washing towels. Chapter 10. Two days later, the new washing machine arrived while my dad and I were working, as did an unexpected guest, Uncle Ming. Uncle Ming wasn't really my uncle. That was just what we called family friends in China. But he had worked in the same hot, sweaty kitchen as my dad last year, and we hadn't seen him since then. How he managed to drive himself to the Cala Vista, I had no idea, because smoke was coming out from the hood of his car when he arrived, and the bumper was falling off, and Uncle Ming himself actually looked worse than his car. He had a swollen black eye and bruises all over his cheeks and neck. What happened to you? My dad asked, rushing over to help his wounded friend inside. He led Uncle Ming into the kitchen. Uncle Ming winced as he slid into the chair like it hurt even to sit. It's a long story, he said. His thick Beijing accent made me feel like I was back home. He lifted his puffy eyes and peered at my dad. It's good to see you, old friend. My dad gave Uncle Ming a hug while I took out his things and put them inside one of the guest rooms, room one, the nicest one. When I got back, the two were deep in conversation, talking about sharks of all things. That was weird. I didn't want to disturb them, so I stood in the corridor listening. But why, Ming? Why did you go to the loan sharks? My dad asked. I wasn't planning on it, but then I lost my job, Uncle Ming said, and a hundred dollars turned into five hundred dollars. And before I knew it, how much do you owe them? Five thousand dollars, Uncle Ming said. His voice cracked as he said the number. My dad said a swear word in Chinese. What do I do, buddy? They're going to kill me if I don't pay up, Uncle Ming cried. I gasped at the word kill. They both looked up at me and immediately dropped the subject. They didn't bring up sharks or loans again the whole evening. That didn't stop me from thinking about it, though. After dinner, while my parents and Uncle Ming reminisced about China, I slipped out the back door. Hank wasn't in his room but Billy Bob's lights were on. I peered inside and saw that the Weeklies were just starting another game of Monopoly. Mia, they exclaimed when Billy Bob opened his door. Come and join us. I grinned. I loved Monopoly. Can I be the hat? I asked them, plopping down on Billy Bob's bed. The hat in Monopoly looked nice. It looked like a rich man's hat. 
The shoe, on the other hand, looked like a poor man's shoe. You can be anything you want, Billy Bob said, handing me the hat. He selected the race car for himself and the iron for Hank. Fred picked up the wheelbarrow. Quickly, we set up the game. Billy Bob and Fred made me the bank. As we played, I turned to Hank and asked him if he knew anything about loan sharks. Oh, that's nothing you want to get involved with, he said. No siree. You want to stay as far away as you can from the rabbit hole. He explained that a loan shark was someone who loaned people money with very high interest. What's interest? I asked him. Interest is like a fee you pay the person for borrowing the money. So if you want to borrow $10 from me, I would say, okay, but you got to give me $12 back. Otherwise, what do I get out of it? So that $2 is interest, he said. But a loan shark, Billy Bob jumped in. A loan shark doesn't want $12 back. He wants $20 back or even $50. $50, I asked. What kind of people would agree to that? Desperate people, Hank said. People who can't get loans anywhere else. And what happens if they don't pay them back? Hank sucked in air. You don't want to know, he said. I turned to Fred. They'll come and find you, Fred said. Beat you up or worse. I felt myself go cold. Just then, Hank let out a squill. Hot diggity dog, will you look at that? I now own Pennsylvania Avenue and Park Place. Hank howled with glee. Pay up, Mia. That'll be $50 a night. I handed him $50. Hank took the Monopoly money and kissed it. Someday, Mia, he said softly. Someday. Someday what? Billy Bob asked, chuckling. You'll really own Pennsylvania Avenue and Park Place? Hey, it can happen. If it can happen in Monopoly, why not in real life? Hank insisted. Isn't that right, Mia? I looked at Hank. I had a feeling he was just trying to make me feel good but I thought I saw a glimmer of hope in his eyes too. Right, I quickly said.